Good morning. Thank you for having me, not because you had a choice. <laughs> My name is Lauren Etter. If I haven't had the chance to meet you, I get to serve as the women's minister here at Rock Point. And this was not a planned um, teaching. Our sweet Chris has vertigo, which is not fun. If you've had vertigo, that's the one saying, oh no, it's awful. And so um, she would love your prayers because she is very miserable. Um, it's not her first time having it, so she had a feeling it was coming. But she texted me yesterday let me know that um, she could not even sit up. So she is really, really um, ill. So um, we will miss her greatly. But I am honored to be here with you. If you happen to have been here the first day of class, you may have remembered when I was talking about Mark, that Mark is a very special book of the Bible to me because it's actually the first book of the Bible that I got to teach many years ago. And so it has one of my favorite verses I discovered in Mark, and that, that verse is one that was this week. And so when she texted me and told me that she was gonna be, need to be out, when I looked to see kind of what you were all studying, it was no surprise that that verse is one of the verses you were studying this week. So that kind of gave me a warm hug knowing like God was working already. Um, and so it is a very special area of the Bible that I love. Um, Mark 9, 24 is the verse I'm talking about where it says, um, it's a father that cries out and says, I believe, but help me in my unbelief because that is something that gave me great comfort because that is how I feel all the time. Um, if you've been a follower of Jesus for any length of time, you may feel this way, I do, that Jesus is one of those people that the more you get to know him, it, you feel like the less you know. I, studying the word, the more I study, <laughs> I keep thinking I'll get smarter and I don't. It's like, oh my gosh, there's so much I don't know. And only Jesus can do that and only God can do that. So I hope today that as we um, talk or as I talk and you listen, that one, that you just walk away with a couple of um, nuggets of truth um, that make you want to go and study his word more and more deeply because um, Jesus is my favorite person in the world. I can't wait to meet him face to face. So if you'll join me, we're gonna pray because um, God knows I need the prayer and um, we'll get started. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning. I thank you for your word. I thank you, Lord, for the way you wove it together and how you um, prepared me for this morning. I lift up Chris to you and ask God that you will just bring her relief quickly, that you will heal her and that she'll be back here next week feeling healthy and strong. Um, I thank you, Lord, for the way that you uh, provide and go abundantly before us and behind us and all around us. And I thank you for these sweet women sitting here today. I thank you for the opportunity to come together. And Lord, it is not um, beyond my knowledge that we have brothers and sisters in Christ across the world that are suffering um, in the midst of tragedy and fear and chaos. Uh, Lord, I lift up those fellow believers and ask God that you would be with them, that you'd keep them safe. Um, and in the midst of this chaos, that those that don't know you would come to know you. Um, I ask, Lord, that you would bring peace um, and that you would protect our country and our loved ones um, from the evil that just lurks everywhere. Uh, we love you and thank you and ask God that you would just move in a mighty way. In Jesus' name we pray. Um, so, I don't know if, if you've ever had this moment, but um, we're gonna kind of, when looking at what y'all were studying, you're, you studied a lot this week. And so there's no way we can go in depth in everything you studied this week. So we're gonna just skim the surface. And I'm gonna let you know that one of the hot topics that's in this area of the Bible in Mark, it's also in Matthew and 2 Corinthians and some other areas, is the topic of divorce. And so I am going to give you a little bit of a snapshot of that, but I'm gonna tell you it's not me avoiding discussing a very hard topic. It's, I'm gonna give you enough to give you something to work with. Chris is gonna address it in a deeper different fashion next week, which was always the plan. But I wanted to give you something um, from the church's standpoint, um, from our marriage ministry's standpoint. So you had something to work off and discuss, and then she will discuss it at a different depth next week also. Um, I actually forgot that portion while well, I ran out of time last night. And so Chris almost had a heart attack as she laid in bed. I forgot to mention that. So they're recording this today, so it, it, they'll get to listen to it from last night. Um, but I do have to share something funny with you, because I, I am actually curious if I'm the only person that knows this word. Last night, Jessica was telling our Tuesday night group that instead of bringing but, uh, brunch items next week, they're bringing finger foods. And someone shouted out, they're not finger foods, Chris. That's when you have little, or uh, Jess, that's when they have little kids. They're called appetizers when you're an adult. And she's like, I'm sorry, I have little ones. And so I'm like, okay, I've heard it called both, but I have a friend who's from Louisiana. And so whenever we, she gets together, she always says, we're going to have picks. And I was like, we're going to have what? Because she has a very strong accent. And I'm like, we're going to have what? And she's like, we're going to have picks you know, picks. And I was like, what are picks? And she's like, you know, pick stuff up. We're gonna have like little foods. And I was like, has anyone ever heard that? We're just gonna have picks. No. See, I knew she was making that up. Okay, so <laughs> it actually is a thing. It may be a Louisiana thing, but 
See, if you walk away knowing nothing more about the Bible today, I have taught you a new word. So I feel like my job is done. <laughs> picks is another, you have a pick party. So if you ever come to my house, we're gonna have picks. So there you go. There's your knowledge for today. Uh, no, but seriously, one of my favorite parts of my job and my role here at Rock Point is that I get to meet with women who are interested in baptism. And so one of the first things I'll ask someone, if not the first thing, when I meet with a lady who's re- asking about being baptized is, tell me who Jesus is to you. And that's always a testimony, Um, but it's also more about who is Jesus to you? And so in reading throughout the scripture passages that you were reading this week, that that very much became a a, a point of interest for me. And so one of the things I want you to think about as I'm talking, but also throughout this week and through this Lent season is who is Jesus to you personally? Um, Jesus to me has changed and evolved over the years. And most likely um, when you became a believer, or if you've been a believer for as long as you can remember, Jesus has probably changed and evolved throughout your faith because as you get to know him, as you mature in your faith, as you go through different trials and errors and joy, Jesus evolves and changes and your knowledge of him, your experience with him, your intimacy with him changes. And so Jesus may not be the same Jesus to you today as he was yesterday. And he probably won't be the same Jesus to you 10 years from now as he is right now. Um, And there's nothing wrong with that. That's actually how a relationship works. Your relationship evolves as you deepen and establish a deeper relationship and go through life together. Um, If you look back on your faith life, which is something I love to do, I'm not a huge journaler, but I do journal. Um, There's oftentimes I can look backwards and see where Jesus was working that I didn't notice at the time, but I can see now what he was doing. Um, Often in times of crisis or in times of prayer or need, if I can look backwards and see where God showed up in all these important ways, that is affirming for me that even though I may not understand the situation he has me in the moment, I understand the character of who God is because of how he's loved me in the past. And that's one reason it's so important to, to have those moments. And I think that's one of the gifts that comes out of getting out of those seasons. You can look back and see where he was and how he was working. And that gives you comfort when you don't understand his hand at the time. Um, there's a lot of times in my life that I very much share the feeling that this man in Mark 9, 24 shared when he was asking for healing for his son, um, where he shared that he shouted out to Jesus, you know, I have... I, ha- I believe, help me in my unbelief. Um, because that is a real place that most believers are going to be. Because even when you have faith, there are areas of the word that we're never going to understand. There's ways of God that we're never going to understand. And he tells us that, that his ways are not our ways. And so there are gonna be moments where you just have to trust the nature and character of God and you have to move on. And that's where faith steps in. I'm gonna share with you a couple of areas of my life that I've had to step into those areas of of the unknown and be comfortable in the unknown and then areas where God has impacted me in such a way that he has given me so much love and so much care that I can't wait to share all about Jesus. Um, I hate to let you know that I, you probably have noticed, I talk really fast. This is not a spiritual gifting of mine, but I'm really trying to talk slow. So I apologize, this is my slow talk. So you can feel for my team when I'm in fast mode what that's like. when you're thinking about what Jesus, who Jesus is, I want you to think about three things while we're talking today. The three important aspects I hope you walk away from today with are one, I hope you walk away from this morning knowing that whoever wants to follow Jesus must choose to follow him. You know, we are not an army made of automatic warriors for Christ. We've been given free will. And so when you choose to follow Jesus, that is a choice that you have to make. It's a choice you can make any time. And if you haven't made that choice, oh my gosh, we would love to be a part of you making that choice today or any day. But it's the most important choice you'll ever make in your life. And it's a choice you have to make. You choose to follow him. We make it much harder than Jesus ever meant for it to be. It's very simple. All the other stuff we do, all the extra things that we add on, it's just a simple choice to follow him. The second thing is whoever follows him must walk where he walked. We have to walk where he walked. There's a reason he came and he lived in the way he did and he suffered in the way he did and he shared life in the way he did because we have to walk where he walked. And the world wasn't always really good to Jesus and the world's not always gonna be really good to Christians as we're seeing right now and going to continue. And also, third thing, Jesus walked the way of suffering, rejection, self-denial, shame, and even death. There's an advertisement for you for Christianity. (laughs) But those are the sweet parts because everything we've been through on this side of heaven, Jesus has been through on his, on, when he was here also. We serve 
a great shepherd who knows what it's like to walk and what we're walking in. And there's never been a time in our lives, I feel like we're, we're seeing more and more of that. I feel like we get, keep getting like whiplash from 2020. I'm like, it won't stop every year. I think it's a new year. And then we have like a new something coming. Um, I think more than ever, I have been saying, Jesus, just come. Like we're, we're done. Like just go ahead and come on. Like we're ready. I'm ready to go back with you. Um, but the beautiful part about having a faith and following Jesus is that he can, trans- he can transform a faith from a mustard seed of faith into a glowing and growing fervent faith, that your own challenging situations perhaps may be a reminder of the power and glory of the Lord during a previous mountaintop experience. Chris talks a lot about mountaintop experiences because cycling is really important to her family. So they know what it's like to be on those mountaintops and those peaks and coming down. I am one that I'm, I don't like heights, so I prefer not to go biking up a mountain, but I certainly know what it's like to be um, at the top of a mountain and then the valley because the Lord has allowed that in my life several times. In the quietness of your heart, you can speak with Jesus about your need to believe for him in any situation. Your relationship with him now allows the Holy Spirit to minister to your deepest needs. I have had some very strong faith stretching experiences in my own personal life. And I can tell you that um, I wish they were moments of complete and total joy and, and abundance. But the reality of it is, is that my faith growing moments, my muscle growing in my faith has never been from moments that were wonderful and joy filled. They've been from the moments that were hard and dark and scary and where I was crying out for miracles or in need. That is where my faith muscle stretched the most. And so that's the blessing that comes out of those moments. Um, one of those, and I've gotten permission from, to share these stories because they involve other people in my family and my friends, and I think it's always important to honor the absent. So um, before I ever share, I want you to know that I've asked permission to share some of these stories. Um, but one of my earliest memories of um, the power of prayer, which if you know me personally, you know that I, I truly love to pray. Um, that is not just something I say. Um, people know that I love to pray. I feel like it's, a, it's one of the gifts that um, God gave me was a desire to pray and to be with God in those moments. And so I love to pray. So when we tell you that we really do want to pray for you, like that is genuine. We love to pray. And one of the reasons I love to pray is one, it's time, intimate time with God, but two, there is power in prayer. And I feel like it's one of the muscles and one of the weapons that we don't use on this side of heaven enough. Because tangibly as a human, it feels like we're not doing much, but we're not giving it the power and the respect that Jesus intended for it to have. There's a reason Jesus prayed so much. One, I feel like it gave him time to be with the Father, which reminded him of home, which I love. But two, it's because he knew the power of prayer. And so at a very early age, I grasped the power of the prayer and the power of praying scripture. Um, If you, I was born and raised in Flower Mound. And so if you grew grew up or were in Flower Mound in the 80s, you probably saw the story in the news because it was um, big news in small, flower, in small town Flower Mound then. Uh, my brother was about eight years old. I was 10. And he had a horrific accident where he was run over by a riding lawnmower. Um, the lawnmower actually did not have blades on it. Um, The blades had been removed from this lawnmower. It was a lawnmower that we used for pulling things. And so kids got to drive it. Um, It had just the mower deck on the bottom, but that metal is pretty sharp. And so it was just a freak accident. It was being driven. He fell under it. Um, And luckily by the time it got to his neck, uh, it was turned off. And so I was not there by the grace of God because I do not handle blood well. And 10-year-old Lauren would have not been a helper at that time. Um, My dad was also not there. And that was before we had cell phones. So there was no calling him. 911 was a new uh, tool for us to use in Flower Mound. And so my mom called 911, uh, ran outside and picked up that riding lawnmower and threw it about 20 feet. So that's a real thing that you can have superhuman power when you need to have it, when your child is laying in that situation. Um, our neighbor next door, his name was John Clark. Um, he was a parent's age at that point. He was in his 40s. Had learned as an Eagle Scout about first aid care. And he came over and actually held my brother's artery and his leg shut until the ambulance could get there, which saved my brother's life. Um, when they finally showed up at my parents' house, because um, my parents live way out in the country, and there, it was harder to find then. At Louisville Medical Center, they started stepping, and this is all coming from my mom. And she's in this room. She, I got her permission to share. They started stepping my brother's leg because he was bleeding out so heavily full of gauze. They were removing muscle tissue, um, anything inside, and stepping with gauze, trying to stop the bleeding. And of course, my brother is screaming out in pain. Um, they're giving him morphine, but when you bleed out that heavily, your, the morphine drip can't catch up with the pain. And so um, I think my mother probably at that point where some of us have been where you have lost, that the only 
chance you have for surviving the moment you're in is Jesus himself, looked at my brother and said, Nick, let's start praying. Let's just say the Lord's Prayer. And so they started saying the Lord's Prayer over and over and over again. And I think she said by the fourth time she said it, Nick stopped crying. And nothing had stopped on that side of the table. It's just Nick just stopped crying. He looked at my mom and said, it doesn't hurt anymore. And they kept moving, kept moving. But I remember for me, it was like, wow. And from that moment on, as many awful things that came from my brother, and he's doing well now, he's on this, he's still here. Um, but for all these awful things that went on for months after that for my brother and for our family, as a 10 year old little girl, I knew that God was acting. Like as scary as that was, knowing that God did that from the power of praying for him to intercede on our behalf, that meant something to me. And from, so from an early age, that tragedy, that horrible moment that I know my brother and my parents wish had never happened, God brought so much good out of that. He shaped all three of my parents' children's lives. He shaped the way we see the world. He shaped the way we view him. He shaped the way we view the power of scripture, the power of prayer. Um, it didn't mean that I didn't go wayward later in life. It didn't mean that I was a perfect Christian girl. That's not what it meant. But it did mean that that mustard seed of faith I had as a young child grew in a mighty way knowing the power of prayer. Another situation that I wouldn't have asked for as an adult is um, one of my non-spiritual giftings is I have a control issue um, because I like my way. And it's not because I just like my way because I like my way. I mean, I like my way, but it's more out of wanting to protect the ones I love. Um, I have a, a thing about wanting to control every situation so that I can control the situation to protect all the people I love. Like if I can control all three of my children and my husband and my team and the church, and my parents, and my neighbors, and the school. I mean, I, I, I can create my own reality where everyone is safe and everything is good. And that is absurd. So God continues to put me in situations where I have absolutely no control because then I have to rely on him. I don't like it always, but I've learned that. I, you th- keep think, I keep thinking I'll get it permanently. It keeps not coming back. Um, but in this situation, one of my, my areas of my greatest concern was I am not afraid of death. Um, I, look, I love my life here on earth, but I know where I'm going when I die. And so that gives me great peace because I can't wait to be with Jesus in the flesh. But with that said, my fear is being left here with my loved ones going ahead of me. That's what I don't want. I'd rather Jesus come back and just take us all at one time. I don't wanna be left here without them. And so that's what I hate. And so when my mother told me that she thought she might have breast cancer, my world stopped. And I had just entered into ministry by God's grace, just entered into ministry. And when I heard that my mom might be sick, I immediately wanted to shut the doors to my house and pretend it wasn't happening and just weep. Um, But I couldn't do that because I had a job to do that needed to be done. I was in the sound booth for um, a Bible study. And so I was the one that turned the mics on and everything else because God has a sense of humor. And I knew I had to go. And so throughout the midst of that, my mom was having um, all her testing done and um, one of the things that was revealed to me about my faith, a very dark part of my faith that God needed to reveal to me was that as we were waiting for the diagnosis for what my mother had, um, I was just positive. I had prayed so much and I believed so heavily that I just knew my mom's diagnosis was gonna be negative. I just knew it. And so when my mom sent us a text, I thought, well, surely my mom's test was a good test. Like she doesn't have cancer because she would never send a text. She would call about something like that. So Me being such a non-phone aficionado, you know when you get a message, you can just see the very top portion of the message? That's what I saw. And so what I saw was, God is so good. And I didn't even open up my phone because I was like, thank you, Jesus. She does not have cancer. And then my sister called and she was hysterical. And she was like, did you get mom's message? I was like, yeah, why are you so upset? She's like, Lauren, mom has breast cancer. And I was like, no, she doesn't. I looked at my phone and it said, and I looked at, opened it and it said, God is so good and I'm going to need him because I do have breast cancer, but he is gonna be with me every step of the way. And what not only did, was, it cru- was I crushed for my mom, but I was crushed by what that revealed about my faith. That in my mind, my mom would say God was good if her test was negative, not that she would say God was good and I have cancer. And that revealed a very, very ugly part of my faith. And Jesus said tangibly to me, Lauren, what do you believe? If you really follow me, do you only follow me if I give you what you want? Are you gonna follow me now? And so my mother allowed us to watch her walk through breast cancer, watch through several surgeries, watch through a, walk through a double mastectomy, 
all while glorifying God every step of the way. And she prepared us in a way that we could walk through fire and war and all the things that this side of heaven's gonna send us with grace and looking to him for the strength that we don't always have naturally on our own. And that when we don't understand his hand and we don't understand why suffering's on this side of the world, that God will work in the suffering. And he, you can have joy in the midst of weeping and you can celebrate in the midst of sorrow and you can worship while you're wondering where he is. You can have that. It doesn't make it easier, but there is a comfort in knowing that we serve a savior who understands our pain and it loves us deeply and weeps with us. One of the sweetest things about my mom's story is that she loves to carry a pocket cross. And I love pocket crosses because it's a reminder to me. And she can't, you can't take any metal in when you have surgery. And so one of my sweetest pictures is when she couldn't take her, her cross into her surgery, my dad took a Sharpie and drew a cross into each of my mom's palms so that she would have that cross in her hands when she went into surgery. And what that did for my faith, watching my dad love my mom that way, hating my mom had to have the surgery, but watching that and that faith, was one of the sweetest moments uh, that I'll ever have in my lifetime. So I can tell you that I've I've gotten to be the recipient of several miracles in my life, um, which sometimes sounds like, oh, that's so fun. It's really not because you know what? (laughs) We should, when you need a miracle, it's because something really bad is happening. When you're crying out for a miracle, you would prefer not to be asking for a miracle. Um, But I will tell you that it's humbling to be able to see God at work in a way that gives you like a a tangible feeling of how close he is and how active he is in this side of heaven, that you can rely on him to be present at all times, and that you can pick up your own cross and follow him regardless of what's going on this side of heaven because he's right there with you. And that the power of the word, the power of scripture is active and working all the time. And as believers, we've been given that gift and you can use it all the time. There was a really cool quote I saw just this morning, so last night I didn't get to hear it, but I wanna share it with you. And this is from Joel Muddlewell. He's actually, I'm not a big... Um, social media person, but I am on Instagram because my children are, so I have to monitor them. Um, But he is on Instagram, and he's actually a theologian that writes for um, some speakers that I love, and I, I love hearing what he has to say, but this is what he said. He said, the overwhelming promise of Scripture is the nearness of God, that God is with us, and our inability to see him, feel him, or discern his movements don't change his truth. It's the truth we hold on to when our feelings lead us into doubt, It's the truth we cling to when our mind wanders into worry. It's the truth we rely on because truth has a name and it is Jesus. I just love that this morning because I had to share that with you guys. You know, when we talk about that, um, when we talk about Peter, you know, Peter was a talker and Peter didn't always say what he should. That's why I identify with Peter a lot. Um, Peter didn't always, you know, say the right thing or do the right thing, but he loved the Lord so much. Um, But I have a, a soft spot for the, for the disciples because as we start the Lenten season, Jesus, you saw a transition happen this week when he was asking them who he was. You know, he's, they, he's, he's been the Messiah to them, but there's one important area of scripture this week where he asked them who he is. And Peter says, you're the Christ. And that was a very important part of a transition that's beginning because Jesus know his time, knows his time is coming. He's trying to prepare his disciples for what's coming and they just can't grasp that. Um, they, they were envisioning a warrior coming that was going to, to save them from Rome, that was going to rise up. And rather than pick up you know, the, the cloth of a servant to wash feet, he was gonna pick up a sword and seek vengeance on their behalf. That Jesus chose love rather than retaliation. That was not what they were expecting. And so I have to try to think that through their eyes that, that in their mind, this was not the warrior they were wanting. The religious leaders and disciples all expected the Messiah to be a divine warrior that was gonna come and deliver them in a mighty way from oppression. He practiced love over vengeance. And instead of inflicting suffering, he took on the suffering of his children. Um, Unlike Peter's experience where where Jesus tells Satan to get behind him, that was always an area of scripture that bothered me in the beginning. I'm like, why would you say that to Peter? He loves you, why would you say that? Let me explain a little bit of of why that happens if you were not... um, looking into that area of scripture. When, Jesus is, when, when Peter is correcting Jesus, when Jesus is trying to tell Peter, kind of foreshadow what's coming, and Peter corrects him, Peter's applying earthly knowledge to God's will. And that is why Jesus says, Satan, get behind me. Because he knows at that point, that is the earthly side, that's the evil side, that's Satan's side, that's the earthly side of divine knowledge stepping in and correcting God. 
that it wasn't directly at Peter. It was the influence of this world on Peter, trying to apply earthly knowledge to a divine experience. And how often we try to do that. That's one of the dangers as a follower of Christ is that's why you always wanna use your Bible, you wanna use prayer, and you wanna use devout and, and um, loving and devoted Christians around you in your circle when you have situations that come up because something can look almost holy. It can look almost righteous. That's how Satan works. He's not always really scary. He's not obvious. He's just over the line. It's just almost glorifying to God. There may be just one area that looks ugly. It may just one thing that maybe doesn't align up with scripture. It may follow all of the commandments, but one. That's where he's sneaky. That's where he gets us. It's not in the obvious stuff. It's in the subtle, weird, intricate ways he weaves himself into situations. You have to remember that Satan knew scripture himself too. He spoke it back to Jesus. He spoke it back to God himself in the desert. So when you are in a situation where you are trying to discern God's will, if there's any question, if there's any kind of catch to, in, your, in your spirit when you're making a decision, to me, that's Holy Spirit's guidance. So I would always implore you to, to go to someone that you trust and share that with him and allow them to join you in prayer and, and discerning that decision or whatever that may be. Because I will tell you as followers of Christ, God's will and his ways are not our ways. And he may ask you to do and, and, and say and be involved in things that make no sense on this side of heaven. And you have to trust sometimes God's will. He's done that in my life. He's asked me to do things or say things or say yes to things that made no sense in the moment, but I had to trust that I understood his will through his word and through, through prayer and through trusted advisors that I was hearing him clearly. So trust that. That's one reason we love Bible study because you get to be involved with the community of other believers who are also studying and also operating in many areas of the unknown where you all can have time together to share and pray and guide and love on each other in such a way that helps. I feel like Jesus modeled that for us when he had a group of 12 disciples who were all from different walks of life, all different ages, all different backgrounds, all different giftings, but they did life together and studying and learning from Jesus. As we, as when Jesus says, you're gonna to have to pick up your cross and follow me, you know, the cross has become something that we love because of what it represents for us. But back in those times and that perspective, a cross was not something you would want. A cross was something that was a very negative symbol. A cross was something like saying, pick up your death chamber and carry it. Pick up your death sentence and carry it. It was to be put on your back because it was something that you would be ashamed of. It was not something you would want to have. So when Jesus says, pick up your cross and follow me, it's pick up the ugly part of this world, the shame that may come to you for following me, and then you follow me through the war, through the, through the nastiness, through the evil of this side of heaven, and I will lead you out of that wilderness. Jesus tells his believers that the world will hate you for loving me. And we see that more and more on this side of heaven. Christians are definitely becoming the minority and it's becoming harder and harder to speak out in truth because the world does not like the truth that we speak out in. We're needing to arm our children with truth in different ways to make sure that they don't feel like they have anything to be ashamed of knowing their faith. I mean, we look at Peter, someone who loved the Lord. How many times did he not deny Christ? Not one, not two, but three times. I love that area of scripture, not because I want to deny Christ myself, but because if Jesus could model what he modeled in front of the disciples and Peter could still feel the peer pressure to deny Christ three times when he was warned he was going to do it, then that is abundant grace for us for those times where we feel like we should have spoken up or we should have said something or we should have acted in a certain way we didn't. That's grace. Those are reminders. Those are models for us to, rem to remind us that we don't have to act perfect. There was never a level of perfection that requested from us. It was just a call to repent and to pick up our cross and continue following and try to do better. One of the things I love that is modeled in uh, the Bible for me that was revealed to me last year that I had never seen, um, which is another like love hug from God that I feel like I wanna share. This has nothing to do with what we're studying, but I just feel like I wanna share it because it was so awesome. Uh, in Genesis, which is an area of the Bible that many people have studied several times, um, this was revealed to me. I'd never seen it this way, but I feel like it gives great comfort. Um, I was talking to one of our teachers and she had said years ago, someone had revealed this to her in Genesis when she was struggling with raising her kids and, not, and wondering what her decisions or her choices why she was raising her kids had resulted in the choices and decisions that they were making now as adults. And this leader said that it was revealed to her that, look, you know, who, were, who was the first parent 
ever? Well, it was God. And who were the first kids? Adam and Eve. You know, God does not do anything unless it's perfect. He makes no mistakes. He, with, he is without fault. So we can trust that he was a perfect parent. There was nothing he thinks, I should have done that, or I wish I should. You know, Adam should have gone in time out at that point. You know, Eve, we probably should have made her curfew at this point. No, that never happened. God was a perfect parent, and his children still went wayward. So if God is the perfect parent, and his children still went wayward, why would we ever put ourselves in a position where we think that we had to be a perfect parent to lead our children in a perfect way? They gave me great comfort. The Holy Spirit just told me I had to say that. I don't know who needs to hear that. <laughs> it gives me great comfort with my kids. When Jesus tells us to pick up a cross and follow him, that cross, getting behind him, has huge meaning. It's a weight, and it can feel like a weight sometimes. But that weight gets lifted when we remember on, this side of heaven, on the other side of, he- of earth, when we enter into glory forever, that we will get to have an abundance of joy. That this side of heaven, that the pain and the suffering on this side of heaven is ultimately just a small, minute portion of, of what we will suffer when we get to go home and be with God. The other part I wanted to talk about as we look at um, this area of scripture is that there's one area that can kind of sometimes um, feel like they didn't get it back then, but also kind of comes into this side of heaven also. And that's the area of that abundant wealth equals blessings and favor by God. Um, Back then, um, if you were abundantly blessed with wealth, you were looked at as being abundantly blessed by God. And if you were ill or sick or poor, you must be full of sin, which is why you haven't been blessed. In society today, there is sometimes a weird perception that that is still true. There is still this weird perception that if you have wealth or you are symptom-free or everything in your life looks like it's going perfectly, that you have been blessed in a way that you you are higher favored than someone else who has other things going on in their lives. And let me tell you something. That is called prosperity gospel, and that is not true. Earthly wealth or earthly favor has nothing to do with God's favor or his, or his love or divine attention or, or um, guidance for you. If, is wealth a blessing? Yes, if it's used to glorify God. But wealth can also be used to not glorify God. Wealth can also be used as a way to turn you away from God. There's a great movie out. I won't give you the name, but you may have seen it. And there's a scene in that movie where it's a mother who is a loved follower of God who loves the Lord, has her whole life, but is very, very ill. She's blind, she's sick, um, income is, is low, um, just has a lot of hard things going on in her life. And she has a son who's a prominent attorney who's doing really well. Um, and they're having this discussion because it breaks her heart that her, that her son is not a believer. And her son looks at his mother and says, why would I follow the God that you follow? Look at you, you're the most faithful woman I've ever known and you're blind, you're sick, you're living in this house that's so small, you don't have good medical care, why would I follow your God? Look what he's done to you, and you're the most faithful person I know. And he says, my life is, look at my life. I have three homes, I have abundant wealth, I'm known in society, I have a beautiful wife, life is great. Why would I need to follow your God? Look what I've done on my own. And she looks at him and says, Satan is tricky in that way because sometimes he allows no obstacles in someone's life. In fact, he allows you to have opulent blessings because the more he lets you think you did that and you don't need God, the more gilded your cage becomes until it's, until it's too late. And that is so true. Some of the most incredible people I know in my life that have had the biggest impact on my faith life have been people who from the lens of this world has struggled the most, but they have incredible joy and incredible wisdom. And it's because they are looking forward to eternal life and not this temporary life on the side of heaven. Never let your current circumstances define what you think the love the Lord has for you is. He is at work at all the time, regardless of what the circumstances on this side of heaven are. Okay, so we're gonna move on to the part y'all know you're all waiting for, which is the part about divorce. (laughs) Um, I'm not making live, I'm just saying that, you know, this is where I sweat. So um, I sweat because this is a very, very, very important topic to discuss in the church. And I can tell you it's one we take very seriously at Rock Point. um, And I know it's one that is hard to work through. Divorce is mentioned throughout scripture. Mark makes um, a very odd 
um, and very short synopsis of divorce. But if you go into 2 Corinthians, you go into Matthew, you go into several other areas, it's talked at length um, about. And so what I wanna tell you is that this is one reason you can't take one area of scripture and run with it. You have to read the entire Bible and understand the audience and the complete understanding of the complete story within the Bible to understand the concept and the time frame of what God's doing. So um, in meeting yesterday, because I, I, we take it very seriously, I met with Brian Sanders, who's our marriage pastor, and Destin Garner, and Brandon Graham, and we had a big discussion about this because this is something that we walk through a lot in our church with women and men um, who have been divorced, have family who's been divorced, are thinking about getting divorced, or just are struggling with this idea of divorce. And so I'm gonna actually read to you what we wrote down um, because I want to make sure that I give you this platform um, to talk about, and then next week we're gonna have an even deeper discussion about it because I think it's important because everyone knows someone who has walked um, through divorce, whether it was their choice or not their choice. I have a dear friend who was going through it yesterday. And so I think it's important that as believers, we understand this area of scripture because this is an area of scripture that can be used as a weapon or it could be used as a, something that is like a kind and loving hug. And Rock Point chooses to look at the side of the kind and loving grace hug, not as a weapon. Many will approach this passage just like the Pharisees did. They want to know about divorce and remarriage but don't miss what Jesus did. When he was asked about divorce, he discussed marriage first. Number one, God invented it and has a plan for it to become one. And that marriage consists of one man and one woman and is intended for a lifetime. So the first takeaway from here, here is, do you know what scripture teaches about God's plan and purpose for marriage? But what about divorce and remarriage? Mark 10, in and of itself, is not sufficient to develop a systematic theology of divorce and remarriage. Because when you compare it, for example, to Matthew 19, Mark doesn't include what is commonly called the exception clause that Matthew included. The Apostle Paul also wrote about divorce and remarriage in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. When it comes to divorce and remarriage, there are a few issues that are as complex, and we just don't have the time today to fully discuss those issues. As an example, our marriage pastor teaches a 10-week course on the theology of marriage, and 20% of that course is spent on just this issue alone. The various positions held on divorce and remarriage within the evangelical community is about 20% of what we teach in that 10-week course. At Rock Point, we believe that divorce is permitted, but never commanded. When all efforts, have been a, when all efforts to reconcile have failed, one, in the event of sexual unfaithfulness outside of marriage. Two, when an unbeliever divorces a believer. Or three, perhaps in other situations that would similarly destroy a marriage, meaning that every marriage is unique and has its own thread and its own footprint. And so it's impossible to apply a principle to every single person. That is why when you become a covenant member with, at our church or within many churches, we ask that if you are married, that you go through a marriage reconciliation with an elder or with a pastor so that we can work through the areas to try to reconcile that marriage. And if it can't be reconciled, that is with the um, loving care of other Christian believers who provide wisdom and guidance in that situation. For more information on what Rock Point believes, we would refer you to a book, it's just mostly recently written by Dr. Wayne Grudem, and this is what it looks like. I didn't know if I brought it here. I don't have it, but I have a copy if you want a copy of it. Um, and it says what the Bible says about divorce and remarriage. You can also always contact our Rock Point uh, marriage minister, which is Brian Sanders and his wife, or any of our pastors. So that's a very short synopsis to kind of give you an idea of where we'll head next week. Um, that's a large portion of the teaching next week. Where we're going to unpack that with the other areas of scripture and give you um, more understanding of, of the current time frame and how that applies to today's circumstances. But I didn't want to miss out on at least touching on that because you are are going to discuss that in group and also because you're studying it right now. So I apologize for the shortness of that, but um, we just don't have enough time to discuss it all in one week. So we're going to save it for next week. Okay. And then before we finish, I want to remind you that next week you have your luncheon or bruncheon, bring your picks if you remember what those were. Um, but the other thing is that after that, we'll be recognizing spring break week. So next week you'll meet and then next week we won't have class. If you come here, we won't be here. You're welcome to come in, but we won't be here. Um, and then we'll pick up after that um, for finishing out the season. And so the semester is flying by. We don't have that much longer together. So I can't wait to see what God reveals in the weeks we have uh, left. Let me pray for us and you guys can go enjoy your group time. 
Heavenly Father, I thank you for this time together. I thank you, Lord, for um, the word that you have given us um, through scripture. I thank you for your spirit who guides us. I thank you for your son. I thank you for the beginning of this Lenten season where we get to remember and understand the sacrifice that was made on our behalf. Thank you, Lord, for loving us so deeply. Thank you for your grace and for your forgiveness. Thank you for the abundant joy you have placed um, on this side of heaven. We love and and wait expectantly for your son to return, but we thank you, Lord, that in the midst of weighing on him, that we have you here with us, um, living within us and guiding us. We thank you, Lord, that um, you promised to return, and we thank you that in the midst of waiting for that return, that we have your spirit who guides, um, who corrects, who heals, and who gives us just an incredible peace in the midst of what feels like chaos often. We love you and we thank you and we ask God that we would glorify you in all that we say and do. All these things we ask in Jesus' name, amen.